Okay, well, welcome again this morning. Uh, we're going to continue our study in God's providential grace. Now, what I'm going to have this morning is probably uh, quite a bit different than what we've had in the past. And uh, we're going to go to the Old Testament. But there are uh, places in the Old Testament where God is working with the nation of Israel and individuals that are, it's really fascinating. And I like reading some of those old the stories in the Old Testament concerning different men, different people. And uh, you know, God has a sense of humor. When you start uh, reading the Old Testament and how God worked through certain individuals, you know, like David and Saul and Samuel and uh, a lot of those in the Old Testament, Moses. And uh, sometime we're gonna take the time. This morning we're gonna look at Samuel, okay? And uh, I'm going to go through quite a bit of verses here. It's, it's going to be more or less just kind of reading in Samuel. But I want you to, to, to try to um, uh, see as we go, uh, go through these verses uh, how the Lord is involved. It's not just, a, just, not just a, a story about human beings and what they're doing and so forth. That it is, but it also tells us how the Lord is involved in every aspect of it. And uh, which really shows his grace. And, uh, and it shows other things too. It shows his mercy and it shows his judgment, uh, especially in the Old Testament. We don't see God is not judging men today because his manif he's manifesting his grace to us today. That's why we call this age we're living in the, the age of grace because today God is manifesting his grace and uh, to us as the members of the body of Christ. So. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to start in 1 Samuel, and uh, just a little bit of background, and I'm going to, I apologize for going through the, this kind of fast, I want to try to get it all in, uh, but it's just kind of, to me it is kind of comical how things are take place with Samuel, and there is some uh, not so comical places as we go through uh, concerning Samuel here also, but anyway. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and all her sons and her daughters portions. Now it says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Now El Elkanah had two wives, and the one of them was Peninnah, and the other one was Hannah. And, uh, and you notice there it says, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. Notice, why could Hannah not have children? Because the Lord had shut up her womb. Now, see, the story goes on. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. <clears throat> Eli, at this particular time, was the priest, the high priest, and uh, he had been this priest for quite some time, and uh, <clears throat> he sat uh, on a seat in front of the temple there, and Hannah, it says, and she was in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaiden and remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid, speaking of herself, handmaid, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. So she is sitting out in front of the temple here and Eli is seeing her. And she's beginning to pray to the Lord. She says, I, if you would give me a son, uh, a male child, I will in turn give him to you for the rest of his life. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, it's kind of funny that this last phrase here, there shall no razor come upon his head, uh, it's kind of just out, out of the blue there, but if you go back in history, you find out that this is a Nazarite vow. That if you took a Nazarite vow, during that vow, you do not shave your head. So uh, this is why she brings it up here. But 
Now notice I put Shiloh in the, in the green there, and it's, uh, Shiloh was a place up north, north of Jerusalem, on a hill where uh, the tabernacle was. And so when uh, a lot of people would go up to the tabernacle and uh, they might offer a sacrifice, they might do, uh, go up to the tabernacle, whatever was taking place there. Of course, that's where Eli was out in front of the temple. But anyway, uh, up to Shiloh. Uh, this, I got a couple pictures of it. This is when we were there. This is that, that round thing you see in the middle there. Of course, that is the visitor center. You know, they have to make everything that's pertaining to the scriptures. They have to make a big tourist attraction out of it. And uh, this is what they did here. And inside that is kind of like a theater and they have a big screen and they show you a movie and stuff, which is what really interesting, all about Shiloh. But <clears throat> there's another, now from the back side of that, as you look down the side on top of this hill, you see all the mountains, there's a big valley down here. But right in here, kind of where these kind of flags are at, right there, is where the tabernacle was. So you see, tabernacle site for how long? 365 years. The tabernacle was in that spot right there. And even I've, I've heard in the last couple of years that they have found more evidence uh, that that actually was the place of the tabernacle. They found like the, um, oh, like today in our, uh, uh, surveying, you put the pegs in the ground where the corners of the site is at. Well, they have they found those in the four corners of the tabernacle. They have found those. So there's a lot of evidence that is, uh, has come up in the last few years that that was the place of the tabernacle. And uh, we don't realize it sometimes, but you know the tabernacle was went with the nation of Israel throughout the 40 years that they were in the wilderness. And they would, they would move different places. And there is like uh, 33, I think it's 33 different uh, places where uh, throughout the 40 years that Israel camped. And of course, every time they camp, they have to build the tabernacle, set up the tabernacle. And uh, which included, you know, the, the uh, <clears throat> outer perimeter and the, the gate on the east side and uh, of course you have the altar and the labor and so forth. Then you have the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Holy of Holies within the Holy Place, and, uh, and so forth. There's a lot of there, but that's all the tabernacle. Okay, now, back to Samuel, it says, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived. Now she prayed, and the Lord answered her prayer. Uh, let's see, did I? I don't think I had it here. Uh, I don't have it down here in that particular verse, but it says uh, also that when Eli w saw her praying out in front of the, the temple, uh, he thought she was drinking too much because she was praying, but she, her, there was no voice. She, she was just moving her lips. And so uh, he approached her and mentioned to her, you've been drinking a little bit, haven't you? She said, no, she's just praying to the Lord. But anyway, that's kind of a comical thing that happened at that time. But anyway, it says, Wherefore it came to pass when the time was come after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel. <coughs> now I'm skipping a lot of verses here because we, it's going to take too long if I don't. <laughs> Saying, Because I have asked of him of the Lord and the man, uh, Elkanah, and all his house, went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned, be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Now, of course, that's a good reason why she wouldn't, because when she did take her son Samuel up to the Lord, to, to Eli, that he, he, she was going to give him to the Lord, and she would no longer see him again, at least because he would spend all the time with Eli, in the, in the temple. So, <clears throat> for this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. So there, she's just uh, remembering the, the Lord, when she prayed for the Lord, that he answered her prayer. Therefore also, I have lent him to the Lord. That's kind of interesting how that is worded, isn't it? Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. 
In other words, you lend him out to the Lord. <laughs> For as long as he lives, though, as long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And Elkanah went to Ramah, to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were, now if you read in your scriptures, uh, if you're following along, it, it, says, uh, the, it says the sons of Eli were uh, sons of Belial, I think, if you look in your scriptures. Well, Belial was a god um, that in that particular time that they worshiped. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know how, and I didn't have time to look at all the, all the different um, uh, translations and so forth, but you notice in, in mine, in my Bible, this is the way it is. It doesn't say we're sons of Belial, it says sons, worthless men. So I don't know, maybe some of you have something like that also in your uh, translation, but it, uh, it says worthless men. And if you well, we find out as we go on the story, you'll find out why they're called worthless men. Uh, they knew not the Lord. Now, these are sons of Eli. Now, the way that the priesthood uh, went at that particular time, it was always the sons of the priests were the ones that were next in line to become the priest for the tabernacle or the temple. It was always the sons that were brought down. And, and we went through this so quite a while ago now. When, when uh, Remember when David uh, pointed out all the, uh, and set the, uh, the number of priests according to, their, to the sons, uh, how they would take care, they would trade off every week. And a different, a different son or a different priest would uh, do his duties in the tabernacle or temple every, every, every week. Anyway, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They knew not the Lord. Now, the sons... How did I get that in there? Okay, well, anyway, uh, I got slide number eight right over. Hophni, Hophni and Phinehas were the two sons of Eli. Okay, just remember those, those, those particular sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. That's speaking of his two sons. For men adored the offering of the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him year after year, year to year, when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Um, so remember, you know, that's what they did, the Jewish people at that time. Every year, they'd go up and offer a sacrifice. And they'd go up to the, uh, uh, in this case, Shiloh, or uh, wherever the tabernacle or temple was at. <clears throat> uh, and Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. So that's when they gave Samuel to uh, Eli the priest that he would minister uh, there as a young boy. And immediately after he was weaned. Now Eli was very old and heard that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, you know why it's called, they are called worthless men. Eli's sons, who were supposed to be, take over the priesthood, what they were doing, uh, they would take women who would come up to the tabernacle or the temper, temple, and really what they, they did, they turned the place into a place of prostitution. Now, uh, you probably can figure what the Lord is going to say about that. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Now he's getting pretty old here and I think you'll see here that he is what, uh, 89 or something like that in just a minute, but he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was and Samuel was laid down to sleep. 
So it was in the evening. Uh, Eli uh, was going to lay down there, and, uh, and uh, it says his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. He couldn't see the light anymore in the tabernacle. But anyway, at the same time, Samuel laid down to go to sleep. That the Lord called Samuel. Now, this is probably part of the story that a lot of you remember. The Lord called Samuel, and he answered. He says, Here am I. And he ran into Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, Eli says, I called not. Lie down again. Go back to bed. And he went and he laid down. Samuel did. The Lord yet called again. Notice it says the Lord called him. Well, as far as Samuel's, because he didn't know it was the Lord. He thought it was Eli. So called again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli, now Eli is putting things together here, and he says that he perceived or understood that the Lord had called the child Samuel. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Now notice how many times here in these verses it's talking about the Lord. The Lord called Samuel. The Lord did this. The Lord did that. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel that which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. Well, that's, that's kind of comical, I think. <laughs> which both the ears of every one that heareth shall tingle. So, uh, in that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Okay, now the Lord is saying, I'm going to judge Eli. Why? Because uh, the iniquity which he knoweth is in his house. Speaking of the two sons. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Now you would think that the Lord would take care of Phineas and um, the other one, <laughs> the two sons. But here, which he will, by the way, but here he's going to judge Eli. Because Eli was the father of these two sons. And Eli did not rule his sons, his household, in a way that his two sons would be prepared to take over the priesthood. So he's coming down on Eli. You know, that's kind of a, a lesson even for uh, every, every family. I mean, if, if the father or the parents do not discipline the children, uh, it can come back on you. <laughs> and sometimes not very good. And therefore I have sworn into the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. So, what is the Lord telling Eli? He said, hey, because you did not take up care of your two sons and did not discipline them, that they should be, uh, they could take over the priesthood. Therefore, even if you offer a sacrifice or any other offering, it's going to mean nothing. I mean, it, it's, you're doomed. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is this thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? Now, you've got to read a little bit between the lines here because the Lord has already talked to Samuel in between here. And, uh, and Eli knew that, so he said, What is the thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God does 
do so to thee, and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. So Eli knew that Samuel knew something. He got a message, he had a vision, or something from the Lord, and the Lord told him something uh, concerning Eli and his family and so forth. And Eli wanted to know, hey, what did the Lord tell you? And what did Samuel say? And, and Samuel said, he didn't want to. He didn't want to tell, because you'll see what, what the Lord told Samuel. But Samuel didn't want to tell Eli, but finally he convinces him to. And here it says, And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Now, if you know the geography of Israel, you know that San, Dan was clear up in the northern uh, part of Israel, northern border, and Beersheba was clear in the southern border. So it was all of Israel. All of Israel knew that Samuel has been established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord received himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. Now, we're skipping over a few, quite a few verses here, but it's kind of strange how this all happened here. Now, uh, let's see, do I have, I don't, there should be another verse right in here. But anyway, uh, Eli, or Samuel does go to Eli and tell him what he saw. And, uh, and it's, it's what is going to take place here very shortly. So, so all, all of Israel, so the word of the Samuel came to all of Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle and pitched besides Ebenezer. And the Philistines pitched in Aphek. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. Now, <clears throat> the Philistines. Uh, as far as the location of the Philistines. Um... The, uh, the location is where, um, where, they're, where they're fighting today. Oh, what's the name of the place? Gaza. Gaza. Yes, Gaza. That is the area where the Philistines are at. We're at at this particular time. And, of course, by this time, the Philistines, uh, there was a lot of the Nephilim in, with the, in, in, intermingled with the Philistines. And, of course... Uh, the big story that we know from the Philistines was Goliath, the giant, was part of the Nephilim, and they were in with the Philistines. In fact, they, a lot of these giants were part of the, the army of the Philistines, as was Goliath. Okay, and the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel when they joined battle. Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field of 4,000 men. So the Philistines came against Israel and killed over 4,000 of the Israelites. Now this is part of the judgment of God upon Eli and, and Israel. But notice else what happens here. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. Now we had 4,000, and now 30,000. And the ark of God was taken. <clears throat> and the two sons of, e of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. So that's what happened to Hophni and Phinehas. And the Lord worked it out in this battle uh, that Hophni and Phinehas were killed. And... <clears throat> It says there are 30,000 footmen. Now, if you remember, uh, as Israel fought different uh, tribes and groups of people, they always had the Ark of the Covenant in front of them. In other words, the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and they would always go first when they, when they went into battle. And because of that, God was with them, and they always won the battle when the Ark of that Covenant was in front of them. Now, obviously here, the Ark of the Covenant was not in front of them, 
and the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant because they knew. I mean, all, all the uh, Middle East, <laughs> they all knew the power that God has shown in the nation of Israel. Already, uh, there's many references that they remembered what God did as far as, as bringing them across the Red Sea and the many miracles that God had uh, um, accomplished with the nation of Israel. So here the Ark of God was taken, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were slain. Now the Ark of the Covenant's gone. Now what did the Philistines do? And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh. This is the, out of the army of the Israelites. And uh, a man came out of that army and he came to Shiloh where Eli was the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. <laughs> In other words, he just came from the battle. His, his clothes were torn and there was dirt on his head and, and so forth. And when he came low, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart was trembled for the Ark of God. He knew the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen. And so therefore he was trembling because he knew what, how important the Ark of the Covenant really was. And you know, the Ark of the Covenant, what, the, what is so special about the Ark of the Covenant? It's because that was the meeting place. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat where God was there in presence on the Ark of the Covenant and it was the meeting place for the nation of Israel for the priest to go meet the Lord and uh, sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat and so forth, you know, because of the sacrifices. Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the Ark of God and when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. Now they were worried the Ark of the Covenant was gone. And the messenger answered and said, Israel fled before the Philistines. Why did the Philistines have domination over the, the Israeli army at that time? Because they did not have the Ark of the Covenant with them in front of them. The Philistines now have already stole, stolen it. That's why we see 30,000 of the uh, uh, Israeli soldiers uh, killed. And it came to pass when he made mention of the Ark of God, what happened to Eli? He fell off, off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel for 40 years. So now we see what happened to Eli. Well, let's go on. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas's, uh, uh, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken and her father-in-law and her husband was dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. In other words, that caused her to go into labor right now. And about the time of her death, the woman that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. So when she went to labor and, was, and uh, had given birth to a son, the woman beside her had to tell her that it was a son, but then she died. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel. And by the way, that's what's, what the meaning of Ichabod means. It is departed. So it's talking about the Ark of the Covenant, which is the glory of God, the presence of God, departed from Israel because the Ark of the God, Ark of God was taken. Because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the Ark of God is taken. Well, now what's going to happen to the Ark of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of God. This is kind of interesting, I think. And the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon. Dagon was a statue, an idol, that the Israelites worshipped at this particular... Or I'm sorry, the Philistines were worshipping at this particular time. Now, throughout the scripture, if you remember, when we went through... Uh, 
Genesis uh, 6 and the Nephilim and so forth, which we find out that there are many gods that Israel, Egypt and Israel worshipped and at that particular time, and they were uh, uh, not following the Lord whatsoever. And because of the Nephilim and the people that were in Israel at this particular time, Israel got involved with uh, these, the, the, the giants and the Nephilim and so forth, which, by the way, were very evil. And uh, out of that, they made many statues. We have the statue of Dagon. We have the statue of Molech. And there's uh, El, the statue of El, and the statue of uh, uh, Baal. And it just goes on and on and on. It all depends. The different names, they're all the same God. Same one. But the different names depends on which tribe or which location in that area, that geographical area, that they gave the name. And this particular Philistine's here, but uh, they named theirs Dagon. And remember, these statues were not the gods themselves, but they represented the god which they were wor wor worshiping. So, and when the, they, they of Ashdod rose early on the morning, Marl, behind, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. So they set the Ark of the Covenant in front of Dagon. Well, what happened to Dagon then? The next morning they look, and Dagon, he's flat on his face. Set him in his place again. And they, they took Dagon, set him up again. When they arose early on the next morning, uh, what happened? Behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. That's where I think the Lord is, shows his sense of humor in a way. When he was judging these people, but um, anyway, so now what are the Philistines going to do? And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds, tumors, in their secret places. Wow. So now, <laughs> the Lord... Uh, and why there? I have no idea. But he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds or tumors in their secret parts. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. we got to get rid of this thing. I mean, it's destroying us. And they said, if you send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering. <laughs> then you shall be healed. So they're, 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 now they're going to try to appease Israel and the Lord <coughs> by sending the ark of the covenant back, but they're going to send an offering with it. They shall be healed, and it shall be known unto you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering which she will return to him? They answered, Five golden tumors. Can you imagine? They made five golden tumors and five golden mice. Now the mice and the tumor, they, re they actually represented different authorities within uh, the group of the, of, of the Philistines. Um, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, there we go, for one plague was not on you all and your lords. Okay, now what are they going to do? They take the ark of the Lord, they lay it upon the cart. Now they made it, they made a new cart uh, to transport the ark of the covenant because they're going to, they're going to try and see if the Lord is going to, is really wants the ark of the covenant back with the nation of Israel. So they take the Ark of the Lord, they laid it on the cart, put the jewels of gold, in other words, these golden tumors and mice, which they returned him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by the side thereof, and sent it away, that it may go, and see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beshemesh. Then he had done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand 
that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. So they, they're going to put this Ark of the Covenant on a cart, and it doesn't say right here, but let's, uh, well, let's, let me read this first. And the men did so. They put the Ark of the Covenant on a cart, and remember they said they were going to send it, send it back. Well, it says the men did so and took two uh, milk kind, which is um, milk cows, <laughs> okay, cows that had calves, and tied them to the cart. And then they shut up their calves at home. So they take these two cows, they, they fasten them to the cart, hook them up to this cart, and what they're going to do now, they're going to tell these, they're going to just let it go and see where these cows go. Well, they kind of, you know, stacked the deck, didn't they? They took the calves off to the side and penned them up. Where do you think the cows are going to go? So they took the kind, took the straight way to the way, uh, let's see, go images of their emeralds, okay. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh, which is where Israel was at. Them cows took off. They didn't care about the calves. They went right straight to Israel. And notice what it says. And they went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them unto the border of Beth Shemesh. Who do you think was directing those cows? <laughs> the Lord was involved in all of this. And those cows went directly to Beshemish, where Israel was at. And he smote the men of Beshemish because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Boy, that's one thing you don't want to do. Remember when even when they were um, um, carrying the ark. Remember the man that uh, when, when, they, when, when they tripped and the ark went over to the side and the one man that was standing there put his hand up to, to keep from falling over. What happened to him? Immediately he died. Immediately. So uh, <clears throat> even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. And the men of Beshemish said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? Now, what do we learn from that? The Lord is in control. <laughs> the Lord is sovereign. The Lord is in control. The Lord at times shows his mercy and his grace. Many times he has shown grace to the nation of Israel. Um, in, the, at, uh, in Genesis chapter 6, we see that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Moses found grace in the Lord. And likewise, many of the Old Testament uh, patriarchs uh, knew of the grace of the Lord. Now, at that particular time, of course, that was under different dispensation, a different time period, and judgment, as we have seen here, many men were killed by the Lord because of disobedience. So there was judgment upon them. Now, that, by the way, that is not happening today. God is not judging men today in that same way. We're in a different area, different, uh, different dispensation. We are in the age of grace. Like I said earlier, this is the day when God is manifesting his grace towards us. So when things go wrong, um, we ask for help. Or we, and maybe, maybe God, through his, uh, his mercy, and, uh, um, will, will help us out and do something. I mean, he, he still performs miracles, but it's just the Lord that is doing it. He does not do it through any instrumentation of any other man. Uh, but when the Apostle Paul, when he had a problem, a health problem with his eyes, he, he prayed to the Lord three times. Would you please remove this uh, from me, the problem that he had with his eyes? And what did the Lord say? He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And that's, uh, we need to remember that in uh, this age in which we are living in that uh, God's grace is sufficient. Um, so anyway, and notice how many times the Lord, it says the Lord, the ark of the Lord, and the Lord, and so forth. And, and we know that God, God was in control. But it's just, uh, to me, it's kind of humorous. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Uh, but uh, anyway, 
In the future, we might look at some other stories in the Old Testament. But anyway, we can learn from it, even though it is in the Old Testament. You know, that Apostle Paul says in Romans that the Old Testament is for our learning. You know, yes, his, his, Paul's epistles is the one, is the part of the Bible that gives us direction and uh, for, for living in the age of grace. But there's many things we can learn about the character of God and how God has, has worked in the Old Testament, which show, shows his grace and his mercy even in the Old Testament. So we can learn a lot of things from the Old Testament. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, and especially uh, now as we live in this age of grace, that uh, you might guide and direct us in your word, that the Holy Spirit might uh, enlighten our hearts through your word, that we might be a better testimony for you. So we just praise you and thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us, that we, we do have a position in the heavenlies with you for all eternity. So in this we thank you. So we just ask now to be with us wherever we go. And this we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.